It is my pleasure to welcome Len Kiefer to the show. He is the Deputy Chief Economist with Freddie Mac, and he is coming to us today from their headquarters, which has about, I don't know, five to 7,000 people in the campus. And Len, it's great to have you on the show. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing fantastic. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Our pleasure. So a lot of people obviously are speculating about the real estate market. They've been speculating for quite a while and everybody pretty much was, I don't want to say everybody, but it's a figure of speech, was pretty much thinking the real estate crash is upon us when those big rate hikes happened over a year ago. Yet the exact opposite had happened. And Freddie Mac, as well as many others, revised their forecast up. And they did that sort of, I guess, mid-year this year. I just want to get your overall take on the market. And you've got a bunch of excellent charts and graphs we're going to look at as well. So I'm very excited about that. But just kind of give us your 30,000 foot view, if you would, to start. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Jason. You know, I, I work, you know, in our economic and housing research group with our chief economists and other economists there, you know, at Freddie, and, and we think a lot about sort of just at a big picture where we think the economy is headed, what's sort of going on and how that's going to then impact, you know, housing and, and mortgage market is sort of the, the chain. But you got to really talk about the big picture about the macroeconomic environment in terms of inflation and interest rates, which has been the dominant story. And in this Despite the challenge of higher interest rates and tightening financial conditions, the really resilient U.S. consumer. And so since the U.S. economy has held up pretty well throughout the first three quarters of this year and into the fourth quarter, that's provided, you know, the backstop to kind of surprise us a little bit in terms of where the economy is headed and where uh, the housing market ha has been. Um, and so the real question looking now at the end of 2023 is, will that continue into 2024? Most of the analysts and ourselves included are expecting to see a bit of a slowdown in consumer spending. A lot of the really strong data we got through the later parts of 2023 were buoyed by, you know, the, the very strong stimulus and support, uh, the a lot of savings that households had built up. They're starting to run those down and the weight of higher interest rates probably going to bring consumer spending down a little bit. We're even seeing that in the, four, the kind of high frequency read on the fourth quarter. It's a little bit slower economy higher rates, but that leaves us with an open question of, well, what will the housing market do? Because in 2023, we kind of had two things going on, right? We had high rates, very low transaction volumes, low levels of refinance, low levels of home purchases, but prices held up and even re-accelerated. Uh, and, and so is that going to continue as kind of top of mind question, something we spent a lot of time uh, thinking about, and we've done a lot of research and happy to share and discuss that as we go throughout today, maybe to kind of help kind of anchor things. It might be useful to look at the first slide I got, which has got two charts on it. I love charts. So I got two of them on here on the left panel. Uh, you've got mortgage interest rates. So Freddie Mac has been tracking mortgage rates on a week to week basis going all the way back to 1971. Freddie was founded in 1970. So almost as old as Freddie Mac itself. We've been tracking mortgage rates in the United States for, for 30 or sorry, 50 plus years. That's what you're seeing on the, on the chart here. We got up to as over 18% in the early 1980s. Since then, you know, the last you know decade, we've gotten used to these super low interest rates in the United States. That's gone away in 2023, quite quite significantly. Rates are all the way up, all over seven percent, and got close to eight percent in our survey uh, uh, for the low, over the summer and into fall. Uh, that's quite different from what we've been used to, and and coupled with high house prices is just really walloped affordability. Housing affordability, there are different ways to measure it. The NAR index I'm showing you on the right panel has housing affordability the lowest since 1985, the summer of 1985 when Back to the Future was the number one film in America. That's kind of multi, almost you know two generations, depending on how you count it. Uh, we haven't experienced that, so that that's that's kind of the major macro driver in the housing market, and one of the major things we have to deal with and think about the consequence, not just of how where the rates are at an absolute level, but how fast they moved up. How fast they moved up kind of has two major implications. One is on the on the mortgage side. There's just not a lot of room for refinance activity. 2020 and 2021 were some of the strongest years ever in terms of refinance volume. A lot of folks were originating a lot of loans. People were locking in low rates. We actually published statistics that showed about one in five homeowners actually in 2021 were refinancing double, right, within a year. 
it refinance and refinance oh, yeah. again because rates had fallen. That's gone away, right? And, and there's just not much sensitivity, even if rates were to drip dip into the sixes, even high fives, not a lot of volume potentially out there in terms of the amount of, of, of refinance activity, which I've got a chart on the uh, next one. Uh, show and just the distribution of rates. Um, you know, these are this is the looking at interest rates on mortgage-backed securities, right? Where the mortgages end up, a lot of them in the twos, threes, right? That's the bulk of the distribution. You ask sort of who's in the money for a refinance at today's rate? Effectively, no one. You've got almost no volume, and even if rates were to drop from today down to the sixes, still very little relative volume. People have locked right. in. That distribution skewed way to the left because all of those homeowners that refinanced or purchased homes in 2020 and 2021 and even early 2022 have locked in these these very, very low mortgage interest rates. They're not going to be interested in refinance. They're also probably and not going to be- they've got 28 years left. Yeah, they've got 20. <laughs> yeah. They've got, they got a long, long time. Right. Um, yeah. and, and a key question, we haven't had to deal with this for 40 years, right? Because, yeah. you know, you go back to the early 80s, rates have been declining. I mean, they've had blips up and down, but essentially been declining. We haven't experienced any kind of lock in. And I had to go back in the archives. So I'm a, you know, economist, like to look at old research. Back in the 80s, uh, there mm -hmm. was, you know, some research done on the interest rate lock in and uh, uh, Professor uh, Quigley, who was at the, um, I believe he was at Cal had done a study published in 1987 looking at the mortgage rate lock-in and they found some some numbers and we actually did an update using Professor Quigley's approach um, which we published if you go forward to slide I actually have a, have, a, have a numbers to show we published this last uh, over the summer where we lose Professor Quigley's approach to say what's the sort of value of the lock-in because you definitely hear a lot right it's locked in consumers have locked in they got these low rates we showed you know the big increase in rates but what does it actually mean from an individual consumer standpoint or an individual borrower. So we applied a methodology where we said, let's just calculate what's the present value of the mortgage payment that people at 28 years that a borrower's got left versus what prevailing rates are and, and calculate how much that's actually worth. Now, in America, most homes mortgages aren't assumable, which means they can't take that mortgage with them if they move, right? right? So, so they got to lock in, right? What's that dollar value? It's about $55,000 per borrower in the Freddie's portfolio through June of, la of, of this year, right? Okay, so let's, let's just understand yep. what that is for yep. a moment. So what you're saying is the value of these ultra cheap mortgages, 65% of the country has a mortgage at or below 4%, 25% yep. at or below 3%. It's absolutely a, a situation we've never had before. It's, it's a, yep. an amazing situation. Uh, so the average value to that homeowner is $55,000. So in other words, like, can, is it proper to think of it this way, that if someone has a $300,000 home, mm -hmm. it may only be worth $300,000 on the open market when someone gets a new mortgage for it, but to them, it's worth $355,000. Yeah, that, 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 is, that is a way to think about it. Another way we did it was to do another a related exercise. Now, the reason we did this approach is because we could compare it to what you know, Quigley had done in the 80s. And actually, this is much larger. So in some sense, because rates were almost zero, right? They got down in the twos and threes. The actual magnitude of the lock-in effect is, is actually bigger than it was in 1980 and 1981. Another way to think about this is to say, let's think of the exercise. Uh, if you're a homeowner, and you've built up all your, you got your equity, right? And you got your low mortgage rate, your 3% your mortgage. And you ask, I want to go out. I want to take all my equity. I want to go buy a new home. I want to sell my existing home, take all the equity from that home, go buy a new home and ask. And I, what I want to do is I want to keep my mortgage, my monthly principal and interest payments fixed, right? I just, I like my low payment. I want to keep it fixed. So I ask, okay, if I go out, take all my equity, put it all as a down payment, get a new mortgage at prevailing rates, What's the value of the home I can afford to keep my payments fixed? It's 20% less <laughs> than what my current home is. So that's another way to kind of think about this 55,000. It's, it's like a 20% reduction if you want to keep those same payments. Uh, that, and many people are just like, no, I'm going to stay put. Why would, I, why would I sell my home, have to get a smaller home and pay more for it? I can just enjoy the, the low rates I got, maybe do an addition, try to yeah. make it work. Um, and, and this is why um, one of my predictions, Len, has been that the home improvement business is going to be a pretty good business 
because people can't take the mortgage with them. So they're going to improve the property they have. They're going to remodel the kitchen, the bathrooms, you know, add a, add a master bedroom, whatever. And so they can keep that mortgage, but still get a nicer home, if you will, or they're going to turn it into a rental property maybe and, and somehow figure out a way to keep it. And this has been the narrative, right, since the rates went up. And we're all pretty familiar with this. We've talked about it ad nauseum on the show. But it does seem like there is a little bit of sort of acceptance by home owners and home buyers. You know, they're one and the same many times. They, you know, sell their existing home and buy a new one to actually accept uh, just because they, they have the money, they can afford to do it and they just want to do it and they're just going to bite the bullet and pay the much higher rate on a new home and relinquish the home they have which would be kind of nice because inventory is so low we really need to free up some inventory and interestingly too the inventory is tracking and i'm sure you have better stats on this than i do of course but the inventory has increased slightly and the purchase volume has also increased about the same. They're tracking together pretty well, whereas the doom and gloomers have been predicting that inventory would rise and there wouldn't be any buyers there to catch that increase in inventory, which so far has turned out not to be true. People are willing to buy that inventory as it comes on the market so far. Yeah, two two really interesting things and things we have some lively debates in the economist team and others, you know, at, at Freddie Mac thinking about this because it matters so much for how things will play out. Right. This this lock in effect, if it's fifty five thousand dollars, say that's just a kind of a way to think about it. you got to give that up if you move. Life will happen. People will have, you know, job opportunities, their family situations. Right. It'll give you a little painful to give that up. But over time, the effect of this lock in effect is going to diminish. Now, key question, is that 2024? Is that 2025? But over time, right, people will, you know, will move on, right? They'll move. I think one of the key important factors that you got to think about is how fast rates went up and sort of how that affected the psychology in 2023 particular. A lot of folks said, look, I'm, I'm seeing rates moving up. I had conversations with folks, you know, in the office around. They're thinking, ah, I'm, you know, I'm seeing rates. I'm feeling nervous about that. If rates, even if they don't fall, if they just stabilize and everybody's like, okay, we're going to pay seven, six and a half, seven percent rate. That's that's kind of the norm. All right. That, that makes sense. And they're not going to hesitate. They may not hesitate as much and life will happen and other events will drive people. You know, home buying decision is so emotional, right? It's tied up with family. It's tied up with a lot more than just the pure economics. Of course, the economics matter, but those other factors will come into play and that's going to drive that decision making. And so I do think that you will see the market start to thaw. It just may be an extended process, um, and it's really going to depend on the, you know, is the economic environment still favorable, or jobs still out there? Do people have and, and I want to I want to make sure you make the distinction for our listeners and viewers. Mm-hmm. When you say the markets start to thaw, what yep. does that mean? An increase in transaction volume, an increase in prices, or a decrease in prices, or increase in inventory? So there's more choices in this very limited inventory environment. What does market thaw mean to you guys? Yeah, yeah, I think that yeah, that's a really important point, Jason. Because uh, uh, as uh, we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about, house prices have actually not fallen, a, or they've fallen in certain locations, but in general are actually Barely, on the ascent yeah. again. Right? They've 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 been reaccelerating here through the third yep. into the third quarter and into the fourth quarter, 2023. Right. So it's not about price. It's about and it's not about performance. Mortgage performance has got done very well. It, it's it's really about the transaction volume and the fact that we've got sort of frozen. Right. The shock of these high rates is like an ice bath. Right. For the housing market. We sort of dove in that sort of everybody gets kind of frozen in terms of transactions. Folks are locked in. Folks are not you know, moving as much. You've got a, a boomer population, maybe that we're looking maybe to downsize that have decided that if I downsize, I got to pay more. So I'm just going to stay with a slightly bigger home than what I need. And so that, that sort of the whole market's gotten frozen on a on a transaction liquidity point of view um, in terms of the, the number of, of, you know, sales. The number it, of it's, it's an interesting market. time because if you talk to a realtor or anybody who's in the transaction business, they'll complain like crazy and say they're starving. But if yep. you talk to 135 million homeowners that don't have those higher rates that didn't buy in the last year and a half, right? they're going to say they're just super comfortable. 
<laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's, it's an interesting it's, dichotomy. We've never had that before. It, it has thrown, it has freed up cash flow. I have a, an aggregate chart, a couple slides up. Okay, so this is aggregate data from the Fed. It's a very aggregate, but kind of simple to make the point, right? How much are homeowners actually paying out of pocket in aggregate for the entire U.S. economy, right? And so mm -hmm. this is for the whole population, met, met mortgage debt service payments as a percent of disposable income. So a very, very aggregate measure. Historically, that's averaged about five and a half percent. For, for mm -hmm. the entire entire mortgage payments over entire income, right? So you got a lot of non non mortgage holders that are in there right, as well. Right. right. So so the historical average debt service burden, if you average all the homeowners in the country, so some of them own their homes free and clear, they have no mortgage, yep. so they're in the average. Some have higher mortgages, some have medium mortgages, whatever. The typical historically since 1980 is only 5.5% of, but, but of their income. But, but it's including renters as well, right? So it's a super oh. aggregate measure. So it's really yeah. just looking for the whole US economy. How yeah. much is mortgage payment going out you know, from a right. service versus aggregate total income? Or, in or rent payment. Or, no, no, it's just mortgage. So it's just mortgage. So it's, oh, but so why it's you a, said it includes renters. Well, it includes renters as the income, right? So the income is total income for the economy. So, so this is a very, very aggregate measure. It's yeah. very crude. It doesn't account for that, right? Mm -hmm. It's not like what a typical buyer is. But what it is, it's sort of from a, just a macro perspective for the U.S. economy as a whole. How much is mortgage debt service sapping up from U.S. GDP, right, or per personal income? That's that's right. that's what it's. So it's so what, right. what why you can do this is you can relate this to aggregate consumption, yeah. right? And you can say if we were at that historic average. That would be like a 1.5 percent income boost, right, or de yeah. decrease, right? So that's right. That, it's very macro, very high level, but it's just to get a sense of what's the magnitude of these mortgage payments. Yeah. So, so what this tells us is it shows us why consumers have more money to spend. Yeah. Because the, their housing cost burden is so much lower than it has been historically. Yeah, yeah you, you come back, you mentioned some of the folks that are more doom and gloom, right? They think about the rate increases. Back in 2008, right, heading into that, there were a lot more borrowers who had adjustable rate mortgages. In 2005 and six, about 40% of new mortgages were arms, right? And they were subject to payment shock as rates went up. Now, 90% plus percent of mortgages are fixed rate, right? So they're not as sensitive to the higher rates, right? Yeah. So we had this, you had the Fed increasing interest rates, you've had longer term rates move higher, mortgage rates up, hasn't affected the consumer in the same way as it would have in previous cycles. So folks that are looking at something like, well, how is the, the Federal Reserve has raised interest rates, we'd expect the economy to slow, the long and variable lags in monetary policy may well be different in large part, I don't think it's a small part at all, because mortgage is such an important part of the U.S. economy, in large part due to the fixed rate mortgages that those homeowners have had. And so tighter financial conditions haven't slowed the economy yet. And so I think that's why everyone is really focused on, you know, what's going to be the late, last data points in 2023 and into early 2024. We may expect to see a bit of a, of a slowdown there, but because homeowners aren't experiencing most of them, right, aren't experiencing a payment shock. From a, if, if say if they had an adjustable rate mortgage, right. the rate resets higher. Suddenly they got to cut back on groceries, got to cut back on other you know uh, spending potentially. Here they're insulated from that, and so yeah. got got locked Len, up in the housing market, but not you, so much for the broader economy. You, you know what's what's interesting about this unusual market we have right now is that all of the doom and gloomers that have been screaming about the real estate crash and the end of the world coming right? They are looking at the wrong time period. They're looking at the last, you know, just a little over a year of higher rates. Yeah, housing affordability is terrible, but that's not what matters. There have only been maybe less than 5 million transactions in that time frame, right? Yep. I mean, there's about 140 million housing units in the United States is my understanding, okay? There's 135 million people that are super comfortable, those are the people that matter because they're not letting go of their house. As I always say, if you want to have a real estate crash, there is one absolutely necessary must have ingredient to a real estate crash. And that is millions of distressed homeowners that have to sell their home quickly. We have the opposite of that. 
We have yeah. we have tens of millions of homeowners who are extremely comfortable. That's why there's no foreclosure activity. <laughs> and, and there's another really important point, Jason. I, uh, it's it's harder sometimes to see, but something that we've worked on a lot. We've done some research. We've got future research coming to look at this question of sort of the slow moving component of housing demand that comes from demographic forces. Yeah. And um, I'm sure others have looked at this, but something that's so important because we have this millennial generation. If I think if I've got a bar chart that's got the generations on it, it might help this discussion. Yeah. So you've got the millennials if I highlighted in orange here for 2022, they were in that age group, right? 26 to 41. Right. And you just yeah. look at that, that, that distribution, right? The largest A's court, cohort was at 32. The median first time home buyer age was at 33, right? They're just moving through right in 2023 and right. into 2024. And so you have this, this updraft, right, of population that's coming through. And many of them were frustrated because they, because of low levels of inventory and available, you know, homes couldn't buy, right? And so there's a big, strong latent demand that late unemployment rates still very low. Incomes have been supported. And if you actually look at this generation, if you look at the age and some of the details and some of our future research is really going to try to unpack this, you look at they're highly educated, they've got high incomes. And as an economist, I'm asked to forecast interest rates, house prices, the economy. Uh, that's very tough. I love forecasting demographics because if I want to say, you know, how many 30-year-olds will there be next year, I can it's count up how many 29-year-olds. Yeah. So it's a, right. it's a good win there. Um, but it's super important, right? Because this demographic forces, they're slow moving, they're persistent, and they really drive the fundamentals of demand. And the, the issue in the housing market is a mismatch between supply and demand. It's been long term. It's been building. And, and that's part of the reason that house values have held up is because we have so much incremental demand coming. You can see that clearly from the age distribution where you have the millennial generation age 26 to 41 back in 2022, which is the latest census data we had when we compiled this data. Um, so you just move everything a year forward <laughs> for 2023. Right. But you look at that and that 20, that largest age cohort, the peak of that age distribution was right at 32 is be 33 in 2023. That's the median age of the first time home buyer. And then you've right. got a bunch more coming, right? Right behind them. And, oh, yeah. and you have the prior group that also have been frustrated because of low levels of inventory for years. It's not a new thing, right? And so they have, there's a lot of latent demand there. And they're pushing yeah. on the marketplace. We're seeing a lot of very strong first time buyers in the market, even with affordability challenges. There's enough of them as a group to really push demand and keep the housing market going. And as we look ahead into 2024 and even 2025, there's still going to be that strong incremental demand, particularly on the homeowner front. There may be some softness for renters as the sort of Gen Z comes in behind a little bit, a little bit smaller, but still in aggregate a lot of them. Uh, yeah. And we can't forget just on the end of the distribution, this chart hi highlights the millennials, but you go out to the boomers, youngest boomer, I believe is going to turn 60 next year, but that, that age cohort is holding on and, and, and providing demand as well because they're not liquidating out of housing as the prior generations have. So yeah. those demographics are critically important and something we spent a lot of time and will continue to look at. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. And, you know, we've definitely heard many years of millennials grousing and complaining about their situation, <laughs> blaming their baby boomer parents. But, you know, that's really not accurate. The millennials are doing quite well for themselves, actually. And they are on the slow life plan. You know, they spend a lot of time being digital nomads, traveling the world, having fun, enjoying life. And there, there's a like a six year lag between millennials and their baby boomer parents. So a baby boomer who was 30, when you're trying to compare yourself to your parents' life, you have to compare it to a 36 year old millennial. Okay, that's the same point, right? And yeah, the millennials have high student loan debt, but you know what they don't have that's expensive? Children, okay? Like their baby boomer parents had, you know, children at that age, right? The millennials are doing that later. So there's just a lot of things that you really have to look at. But it, as I said in 2010, okay, I said the next 10 years, the demographics coming at the housing market, including the rental housing market, are excellent in 2010, and they were. And I renewed that in 2020. We've got seven years left of very strong demographics, maybe longer, coming at the housing market. And really no sign that a whole lot of additional supply will come on the market that's going to solve the demand problem. And with these people locking in 28 years left on their ultra cheap mortgages, 
I'm wondering if we're just going to have a, a many decades long inventory shortage problem. We've had one for a while. I think I have a chart that speaks to that. I got a lot of charts. Yeah, if we go this this one. So there's different ways of looking at this. This is a, a one way of thinking about that same issue, looking at sort of just what's available for supply and rent. And so the way that we build this this analysis up, it's uh, we want it to be pretty straightforward. We just say is what's historic vacancy rates, right? So this is really about what's vacant out there on the market, ready to move in today, right? You could either rent it or buy it. Right? And you ask, what's that historic vacancy rate? And you use a historic average, and you can compare the current vacancy rate to that average. And so when the vacancy rate is high, that means you got extra supply, right? Extra homes available for rent or to buy, right? That's the, the, the bars that were very positive back up through 2010, right? We had almost 2 million extra homes on the market, right? right. And there just weren't buyers, right? And there weren't even renters, right? Yeah. They came very quickly. Quickly, that turned around, right? And that, that 10 years that you said of strong housing demand actually shows up in here as you see sort of the market flip right as house prices started the bottom and returned to positive growth right mm -hmm. around the 2013 period. And then you see initially the rental market was super tight. And then the owner market has become tight over the last five, you know, three to five years, particularly oh. through COVID. And so just by this crude measure, you get a shortage of about one and a half million housing units to just fill in the gap of what's ready to move in. But there's a further lag, right? Because that's not accounting for other sources of demand. This is just what's on the market transacting. If you actually think about, and that's just to take into account the households we have, if you factor in missing households from folks that didn't form households because there wasn't you know, a place to rent, there wasn't a place to buy, this number is actually much demand. larger. I call that shadow yes. demand. Yeah. Shadow demand is, is actually much, much larger than this number. Somewhere, we had an estimate a, a couple of years ago working on refining it to put the total shortage factors in this stuff on the market, but also that shadow demand and other factors puts the number close to 3.8 million was our estimate a couple of years ago. Is that ago. people or households? That is housing units. That's okay. how oh, much housing wow. units yeah. we need to fill in to fill in the gap from making up lost households that weren't formed and to get enough homes on the market to sort of balance the supply and demand mismatch, which is putting pressure, particularly on the for sale market. All right. So that that's essentially two years of production. Now that um, that's that's a very healthy gap. There's a lot of assumptions that go into that. So it could be smaller. But even if you cut it in half, you got two million. Right. So it's still an enormous back. Log and, and it's been tracking, it's been building like this chart shows for the last, you know, decade. Right, <clears throat> and so, right. so may housing well shortage. So your data at Freddie Mac shows that the housing shortage is a real thing, whether it be yeah. rental or for sale inventory, they are both in short supply, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Wow. Yeah, I agree. I couldn't agree more. Okay. Just one more chart on prices. Because we talk about aggregate prices, you know, they're they're going up close to, you know, back, the prices have reaccelerated, you know, to a, close to an, an annualized rate of close to 10 percent here at the end of, of 2023 or the third quarter of 2023, depending on the various index you look at. But it's really acute if you look at it at the entry level. And we've talked about with this low level building, there just hasn't been a lot of new entry level housing created in the United States. And so what happens when you have that strong demographics we've discussed you've got a very strong pressure on house prices. And so for entry level prices, you know, um, uh, lower priced homes, they've appreciated about 62% more than high end homes have appreciated since the year 2000. So it's not a new phenomenon. It's been ongoing, wow. but yeah. you can ne definitely see after COVID that that blue dotted line just kinks up, right? The yeah. demand for that entry level housing really shot up and the supply of it was in very, very short supply. And so when you got, strong demand and, and weak supply, you get prices moving higher to, to kind of balance the market there. Len, can you help us define entry-level housing though? What price range is that? I mean, it depends yeah. on the market, of course, what entry level is, but help us understand what that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are different ways to measure it in tiny font on the footnote, always got my footnotes there. Uh, it says, you know, we got it there, but it's entry-level prices there are 75% are, are of the median or below. So it's, okay. so it's so it's market specific there, and then high end prices are going to sell at 125 percent of the median or higher, and then you okay. Roll so that so what you do is you take the median price in a given metro, okay, mm -hmm. right? So you take the MSA median price, and if you're 75 percent of that median price, you're considered or lower your entry level, correct? And if you're 125 percent 
or above your considered higher end property, right? I, yes. Okay. Yep. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And this is really no surprise at all that the entry level houses have performed the best. That's what we recommend investors buy. We help investors buy properties nationwide. So that's very telling. And you know what? I think this inventory problem is, of course, particularly acute in the entry level housing because builders can't afford to build that product anymore. It's just gotten too expensive with the infrastructure costs, the environmental regulations, the hurricane regulations, whatever it is in your given area, you know, I'm in Florida, so that's the one I'm going to use. But, but you know, the houses are just a lot more expensive to build. That product is, it, they require, you know, if you look at it like a car, there was a time when if you had electric door locks, electric windows, even power steering, or an automatic transmission, it would have, you know, been considered like a really nice amenity in a car. Okay. When I was a kid growing up, we didn't have much money at all. We had a car, a little Honda Civic with no air conditioning, no power steering, certainly not electric windows or door locks, and a stick shift, right? And no mm-hmm. rate. They don't even sell a car like that anymore. And now every car has anti-lock brakes, airbags, all around, you know, all sorts of features, right? That's the way houses are too. The new houses are just loaded with much more stuff than than a house built in 1970 was. And so it's it's challenging, right? Because if you're trying to be a a new buyer coming into this market, no one's building a house for you. There's not much being built there. You know, one way economists like to think about it is they measure something called filtering, which is how housing moves down the sort of income distribution over time. And and in general, in a well-functioning market, which you build new housing and then over time, you know, lower income people can move into those buildings that we found that that's reversed in many markets just because the supply is so short. Right. And so you get reverse filtering that actually over time, you know, the income required to buy those homes goes up. Right. And there's just not new housing be- being built. And, and I think I got one more picture I want to mention that what's happened with these high costs. Uh, folks are still doubling up. Right. Um, we've seen the sort of percent of 25 to 34 year olds that are living at home with mom and dad or mom or dad. Right. They've gone up quite significantly. It's, it's backed off a little bit from COVID period where folks were rushed, you know, push back home, but we've still seen very, very elevated. It's, if, if the number of 25 to 34 year olds were at this, they lived at home with their parents in the parental home was at the same rate it was in the year 2000. That would be 2.2 million fewer of them, right? That, that's like 2.2 million households potentially, right? Or they could marry, so it's 1.1 maybe, or double up or partner or some other arrangement, right? But that's just a huge amount of demand there. Now, some of that's by choice, right? There's some societal, but a lot of that is But, it, but it, it mostly represents shadow demand. Again, yep. there's more demand than we actually can see. So this is a very good chart. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so, so we've, we've tried to size the shadow demand, Jason, like, and it's hard, right? Because you need assumptions and, and doing things, but... Um, it's still quite uh, quite significant there. You kind of one of the questions we've asked is is just like okay, if we've run out sort of of millennials, right? If we exhausted that sort of demand there, um, and, and we found that no, that's not quite the case. Now we've we've run it down, right? We've had a lot of first time buyers. We've had household formations run strong, but you know there's still quite significant demand, you know, uh, for at least for the next couple of years for the housing market there. So if you want to think about the real positive for for the housing market, and, and a lot of folks don't focus on that, you know, there's there's challenges for sure. Um, but but it's something that we we think is really important, and we've done a lot of research, and and are and are looking forward to bringing out more of that next year uh, as we continue to kind of analyze and, and see what's going on there in the market. Very interesting discussion, Len. Anything else you'd like to share with our audience? Yeah, yeah. I would just say that you know I talked. We had a great discussion here. Really appreciate having you. Thank you for having me on on the show here. You know, I talked a lot about our research. The folks can find that on slash research uh, We published it all free of charge. You know, publicly available on our website. People can read and find out. They can contact us, ask us questions. Happy to always help you to engage folks. But you know, we got a lot of rich content there. We publish regularly a monthly outlook. We have research notes periodically that in, for in depth some of these topics. And we're really excited, hoping to push some of those out next year. And folks can find that you know on our website check it out I, I, if you haven't seen it before take a look i can even sign up to get notifications uh, on the on the website there for you know what's the latest uh research coming out excellent good stuff len kiefer thank you so much for joining us
Thanks you.